Hello and welcome to this Blackwell Online podcast. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is Stuart Kelly, who is literary editor of Scotland on Sunday, and author of the book of Lost Books, which, as the cover describes it, is a guide to literature's what-ifs, if-onlys, never-wires, and might-have-beens. In other words, those works that were destroyed, accidentally or deliberately, by their creators or by others, those that were misplaced and never recovered, those that disintegrated into fragments like incomplete jigsaw puzzles, and those that never became more than dreams in the minds of their creators. And in Stuart's hands, what is so entertaining and illuminating about the book is how talking about what isn't there also sheds new light on what is. I think often when we look at what isn't there, we get a better understanding of what authors did choose to write. Hmm. So with Milton, for example, the fact that he contemplated doing an epic on King Arthur the reasons why he moved away from that, I think, tell us a lot about Paradise Lost and, and the way it works. Likewise, that he thought about doing plays and then recast it as an epic seems to me to be indicative of, of the entire mindset of the man. You, in, in the introduction, you've got a, a very nice metaphor for your project. You compare it to Rachel White Reed's house. Can you just say why you, why you made that comparison? Because it's a work of art that I absolutely adore. I suppose the thing was that you know we're, we're so used to looking at for example, houses as being external to being spaces, that when you see those spaces filled, you have a completely new perspective on on what it means to be in a house. And I thought I'd try and do the same with the idea of the canon of literature. I mean, one thing that I find fairly frustrating is that we still have all these arguments in which the canon is seen as somehow self-evident, whereas in fact it isn't. You know, if we had 120 plays by Sophocles, the entire history of literature would be different. People don't tend to sort of think about the extent to which what we have is conditioned by what we don't have. If we'd had, I think, um, probably the most important example of this is is Aristotle's second book of Poetics, Mm. which Umberto Eco used for the name of the rose. If there had been a textbook which told you how to do comedy, then comedy would have been as kind of limited and straight-jacketed as tragedy was for nigh on 16 centuries. So the very loss allows for kind of flourishing. It's a bit like the way in which, um, in which a good forest fire actually allows <laughs> different plants to <laughs> grow up in its wake. And not, that I'm, not that I'm advocating a sort of wholesale destruction of, <laughs> of much literature. Uh, there's a few things I would quite happily chuck in a pile. <laughs> Well, what your book does, and the same way that Echo's book did, is it sort of ignites that spark, to continue your metaphor. It ignites a sort of spark and sets you thinking about the what-ifs, doesn't it? The paths not taken yeah. or the paths yeah. that were sealed off. Actually, there's one which is sort of in the new version of Lost Books, because in this new edition, I've got 10 new ones at the end of it. When I was researching Henslow's diary, this wonderful resource that we have, detailing the rivals to Shakespeare's company and the plays that they put on. The one thing that kind of suddenly leapt out at me was all these biblical plays. They're putting on lots and lots of plays about biblical characters. Now, if you look at the sort of entirety of the Shakespeare corpus and the plays that were sometimes attributed to Shakespeare, we've got examples of all the different genres except religious drama. And that seems to me, without sort of being hyperbolic, that seems an incredibly important thing about Shakespeare, mm. that even though these plays were obviously doing quite well, we don't have a version of Samson or a version of Joshua from Shakespeare. Why was he not doing those things? So what, what we don't have tells us quite a lot about what we do have. Absolutely. And again, I mean, without belaboring the political point, I think what we don't have, I mean, there's lots of different reasons for it. We don't have certain classical plays because of the rise and fall of empires. We don't have many women writers because they were completely extirpated. Everything in my book at least has some sort of shadow or trace in the real yeah. world, but that's just the sort of tip of the iceberg of the, of the vast amount of literature that's gone completely that we'll just never know about. Because to know what's been burnt, you've, someone has got to have left a record of the fact that it yeah. was burnt. Yeah, completely. And there's lots of ways in which we we find those traces of lost books, of, 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 of well, all kinds of lost culture. Mm. You know, people refer to them in footnotes or commentators tell you about it or biographies tell you. There are all the things which don't even get that chance. I was particularly taken with as a, a grave of a Norman nun where it said that she was uh, inclined to writing. 
and we mm. don't have a single word by her. I think we don't even have her name. Now, take, take me right back, because you, you write about your own kind of becoming aware of this phenomenon of literature's kind of shadow history or the, 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 bit, the bit that we can't access. And it sounds like you, you, were quite, you were quite sort of sensitive to that from an early age. Uh, yes, I think probably what the, the truth of it is was that I was uh, always slightly obsessively a list maker. <laughs> I, I remember vividly being in the sort of, I must have just gone to secondary school and I just started to realise that literature was the one thing that I really, really enjoyed working on and working with. And I went up to Edinburgh to the shop that is now Blackwell's yeah. and they had the Penguin catalogue there and I took it home and just made a list <laughs> of all the sort of things. And I thought, you know, once I've read that, that's me done literature. <laughs> you know, I can go and do something yeah. else after that. Mm. I mean, it was a completely ludicrous and self-defeating scheme. Uh, I've actually still got the book where I kept that list, and when I look back at it now, I can shrink at some of the things which I, I thought must be literature because, because they were published by a certain publisher or because I had some vague inkling this was what literature was. And it was when I started looking at the classics that I began realizing this, you'd set yourself a totally ludicrous, impossible challenge because even if you complete it, you can't complete it. 